Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can request a free digital book, Understanding Your Dreams, where you can find my other media and also where you can find my books on Amazon. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. Now here's today's episode. Recently, I did a live stream event where I talked about the roots of self-criticism and some strategies to interrupt and reduce self-criticism. So here are some excerpts from that live stream. So welcome to my live stream. I'm going to be talking about how to, uh, how to stop self-criticism. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Okay. So I'm still getting used to all the graphics and everything. Thank you. Thank you for the input. So I am going to talk about a little bit about the roots of self-criticism, and then I'm going to weave back and forth between the spiritual ways to interrupt it and the psychological practical ways to interrupt it. And uh, I'm, I did get a few questions from people, so I'm going to incorporate the answers to the questions either during the presentation or at the very end. and. If any of you are watching and didn't submit a question, I think you can put it in the uh, comments and I will check those at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to enlarge this. So the roots of self-criticism, they they come from some different places. So if you tend to be a perfectionist or if you were raised with sort of a demanding critical parent, if you were shamed a lot, Um, If you have, if you live in a degree of irrational guilt, there's guilt that we should feel when we do something bad, but then it should go away when we apologize or when we confess it to the Lord. So if you live with a lot of what I call irrational guilt, that leads to self-criticism. If you've been through a lot of rejection, you are probably more prone to self-criticism And if you are a survivor of some type of trauma, the earlier things happen, the more difficult it is for people. But even later in life, we can get into a um, a way of thinking where we blame ourselves and are constantly looking at what's wrong with us or what we think is wrong with us. And that we're not really enjoying life that way. So it's a big problem for people. So what I'm going to be sharing with you is from mostly from my most recent book, Anxiety, Depression, and Helplessness. And I'm going to be looking at some journal exercises, ways that you can change how you talk to yourself, and also how to make sure you're getting positive supports, which also helps offset some of our own self-criticism or negativity. So first, I'm going to start with the journal exercises. Now, in terms of the journal exercises, a simple way to get started is to list 10 strengths or 10 achievements that you you are proud of that you recognize. It's best if you make this list yourself, but you um, you could ask somebody to help you. But I think it's best if you do that for yourself. The other way to use a journal is to keep writing down the negative self-talk and then how to counter it with a coaching statement. I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. Now, generally speaking, there's a few negative things that people say to themselves over and over, like, I'm stupid, or I'm not trying hard enough, or 
I don't know what I'm doing. It varies from person to person, but chances are there's a few that you use over and over. So when I say write down negative self-talk in your journal, hopefully there's not more than four or five that you do pretty often. Now, as you are using a journal and writing down the negative thoughts, I'm going to show you how to watch or notice perfectionistic demands that you're putting on yourself and then ways to soften it with a replacement thought or counter or coaching statement, whatever you want to call it. So some of this is you have to notice it before you can change it and you have to have something to change it to. We can't just eliminate something. Something has to go in its place. Now, if these like straightforward things don't help, then sometimes we have to go a little bit deeper and look for the roots. So this is a lot of what I do with people in my office. So if, if you are stuck and these uh, simple solutions don't work, then you'll have to take some time to look for the roots. And the way that you do that is think about uh, situations early in life where there was pain, where there was anger, where there was betrayal. And you might want to make some notes. And I really think the more specific you can be, the, the better your results are going to be. So you want to specifically write down in third grade, this teacher uh, humiliated me in front of the class and I felt like an idiot or I felt worthless. So you want to be as specific as you can. You don't have to remember everything that's ever happened, but it's probably going to be useful if you have a few of the keys. So it may have been mostly one parent or mostly one teacher. I have an amazing number of clients where it's from an older sibling that just tormented them and their, their parents maybe didn't protect them very well. So you want to journal some specifics of events and situations and the pain or anger connected to it. The next step is the hardest. We need to choose to forgive. Notice I didn't say wait for the feelings because the feelings aren't likely to come. It's a choice to forgive. And the reason we forgive is because it sets us free. It, it generally doesn't bother most other people if we're mad at them. A lot of times they don't care. Maybe they, maybe they care a little bit, but not that much. So um, we, want, we choose to forgive for our own well-being. And for, forgiveness is a, a choice, not a feeling. And it is also not the same as trusting. Some people are afraid to forgive because that, they think that means they have to trust that person again, keep putting themselves in a position to be hurt. And that isn't what forgiveness is. That has to do with boundaries. So we may need to change our boundaries based on how we've been treated by someone. So we want to identify the person or persons, the situations. We want to choose to forgive. And then if you're a person of faith, you can use prayer to take these to the cross of Jesus, the pain. Now, we're used to thinking about taking our sin, our failures to God. But most of us don't think about the power of taking our pain, the sins that have been committed against us. I find that a lot of people make excuses for other people. And you know what? You can't really forgive something and you can't really release it if you are making excuses for it. Uh, this comes up a lot. So I really encourage people, let's not minimize what you've been through. You don't want to live in it, but if you minimize it, if you don't call it what it is, then you can't forgive it and you can't release it. So it's very simple. You just say, Lord, I choose to forgive. And then you name the person 
name what they did to you. And you can say, I ask you, Lord, to take the pain, the anger out of my heart, out of my thinking, even out of my physical body. Sometimes we carry things in our bodies. So it's very simple, but most of us don't know how to do that. I'm not really sure where I learned that from, but this is how, if you are a person of faith, you can use your faith to release things. And then you can ask the Lord to fill you with his peace, with his, uh, if you like scripture, I like Psalm 23, where it says, you restore my soul. And we can sort of declare that over ourselves. Thank you, Lord, you restore my soul. Uh, if you are not a person of faith, there's still imagery you can use. Some people like the image of putting something in a boat and then you push it out to sea or you put it inside of a balloon and you let the balloon float away, put it in that balloon and let it float away. So imagery is very powerful, but again, it, the more specific you are, the uh, more power that these experts exercises have. Now, I mentioned that if, if you have some perfectionistic tendencies, maybe you don't even know that you have perfectionistic tendencies. Uh, this is how you can figure out if you do. So if you're working on this, you can journal your daily stress, the reaction you had, maybe your feelings are hurt, the frustrations you're having. And as honest as you can be, write down your thoughts about it, your feelings and your thoughts. Journaling is the most powerful if you don't just write feelings, don't just write thoughts. A lot of people write down what happened, but they're still not writing down what they think about it or how they feel about it. The more that you can incorporate the thoughts and the feelings, the more power there's going to be in this journal exercise. So you want to notice if you are saying things or writing things about, I should have, I ought to, I never, I never get things right. I never understand what's happening. I always get criticized. So these black and white extreme ways of talking to ourselves may be related to uh, perfectionism, but it's, it's black and white thinking and black and white thinking is, the world isn't usually black and white. There are some things that are, there are some, I, you know, I have beliefs about there's right and there's wrong, but a lot of things in life, they're not black and white. They're not all or nothing. And so if you can sort of work with yourself on the things where you tend to go to the extremes, the all or nothing, the should, the ought to, the never, especially when it's related to self-criticism. Now, people that are critical of others, they do the same thing. But even with those individuals that are wanting to be less critical of other people, I find they're pretty critical of themselves most of the time. So it's almost always necessary to start with the self-criticism, the negative self-talk. So once you recognize it, you can replace it. I'm going to show you some slides in a minute of how to do that. Because this kind of self-talk provokes guilt. It's usually not motivating. People think that if they criticize themselves, they'll be more motivated or they'll try harder. But usually it's demoralizing. I think about the only person that has worked for is John McEnroe, if you remember him, the, the tennis pro. But he had a pretty miserable uh, personal life. And again, he learned it from his father. That's not always where we learn things, but oftentimes it's apparent. So we want to interrupt that. It's not very useful. Um, that way we keep examining our expectations of ourselves our expectations of other people. But today we're focused on what we're expecting of ourselves, how we talk to ourselves when we make a mistake, how we talk to ourselves when we're trying to make changes. Okay. 
so I just kind of remind people that you want to forgive yourself and you want to forgive other people if you want to be in a peaceful frame of mind. We want to receive forgiveness. We want to release forgiveness. If you're a person of faith, you can also draw on your faith. So the Lord will help you strengthen a positive sense of identity, your dignity or your worth, your purpose and your destiny. So you don't want to talk smack to yourself. Uh, the Lord designed you with purpose, with value, with worth. And again, we're not letting people off the hook. We want to choose to forgive them. We still may need a boundary. We still might need to talk to them about whatever's happening. But we don't want to just hold things in or blow up or just stay in a negative place. We want to know how to process our emotions and then make a decision of what to do with it so that we're not taking things out on ourselves or other people. But most of the people I know take it out on themselves. So here's some samples of things that might show up in a journal and then a way to talk to yourself. There are a lot of people that they know how to speak encouraging things to their friends, to their children, to their partner. So really, you're just learning how to do that for yourself. Many of us talk smack to ourselves, things we would never say to other people. So you want to be mindful of how would you talk to a friend, to someone you love, to a child. Where It's not really positive thinking. It's realistic, helpful thinking. So here's some samples. They probably think I'm doing a lousy job. A response to that that you might want to write down in your journal would be, there's no evidence for that. When we try to read somebody's mind, you're probably going to be wrong. Okay, I ought to be doing better. Instead, you can say, I'm doing my best. This is good enough for now. See, notice that word ought. That's that perfectionistic, uh, kind of all or nothing. Okay, I'll never get this right. A different thing to say to yourself is, I'm growing and learning. I don't have to be perfect. Many of you have heard me talk about how I'm always having to work on how I talk to myself when I play pickleball. When I make mistakes, uh, especially if I think it was an easy shot, I get frustrated. So I have to be very careful that I don't start talking smack to myself and say, that was so easy. Why did you miss that? I mean, I may say it. But then I try to correct it right away and say, hey, I'll do better the next time. I'm still learning. I'm not going to be perfect. So I have to use this on myself. But once you learn how to do this, you know, it, it works for all kinds of different things because life throws things at us that we need to know how to cope with. All right. I'm going to give you some more samples. Here's some uh, related to confidence. One negative thought might be, I'm a failure. Instead, you can say, I've made some mistakes. I can keep working on things. I don't fit in. There are people who appreciate me. I don't have to be liked by everyone. So again, you see these are negative. And the negative thoughts are automatic. Um, you can't really control whether or not you get the negative thought. What you have a choice about is whether or not you give it a lot of room, whether you dwell on it, or whether you gently just try to shift to a different way of thinking. I use the example of train tracks. There are certain train tracks that are pretty automatic in our brains. It's just the way that our brain is going to take us. But we can build new train tracks. So every time you interrupt the negative thought, and then practice the positive thought, which you want to write in your journal so that you can go back to it and rehearse it. Then we're building the new train tracks. And little by little, the new train track, the new way of thinking becomes easier 
and more natural. It, it might feel a little bit forced at first, but it's just because it's new. After a while, anything we practice becomes smoother, becomes more automatic. So I talked a little bit about the roots. I talked a little bit about uh, the, the way of thinking and the journaling. So the other thing that we need to do is make sure that we have positive supports. You don't need a lot of supports if you have one or two good ones. And if you're fortunate, you might have a family member or a best friend or a partner that helps you when you're being too hard on yourself, when you're not sure how to look at things. But a lot of people don't have that. So you might need to build some supports and, and ways to do that is you can be part of a club. Sometimes hobbies will help you make new friends, formal support groups, 12 step groups. Your church probably has some small groups, a women's group, a men's group, a Bible study, and other people build supports through volunteering. Uh, I have a, a lot of clients that are, are volunteering in some kind of a Christian ministry, and they build some very strong supports that way. So those are, those are good ways to keep moving and help you maintain your effort. It can be discouraging at first when you're trying to make a change. And so it, we all need people in our corner that help us keep moving. The book that these examples are taken from is anxiety, depression, and helplessness, keys to break free. And then the spiritual exercises are mostly in my book. It's a workbook called life without baggage. So you can find those on Amazon. So I think I hit, uh, most of the questions, there was another one that came in. So I'm going to talk about that. So one of the questions that came in, was what is the difference between self-criticism and humility? So that was a thought-provoking question, and I wrote down some notes about that. I don't know if that's the answer is clear-cut, but um, self-criticism provokes guilt and shame. It provokes kind of frustration, and uh, it's more of a negative way of viewing ourselves. Contrasting that, when we are living in humility, we still see our strengths, but we are enjoying who God made us to be. We all have strengths. We all have gifts. Uh, Zephaniah 3 says that the Lord sings over us. So if the Lord is enjoying us, kind of like you would enjoy a child or a grandchild, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to, to be overly focused on what we still need to work on. I don't think God is nearly as frustrated with us as we are with ourselves. So um, I would say if you are a little bit heavy towards the self-criticism as opposed to what is humility, there's also a little bit more of a tendency to withdraw, to hide a little bit. Uh, it's a little more legalistic and it's sort of like being the mean parent to yourself. So I think those are some guidelines of telling the difference between what is humility and what is self-criticism. And when we're humble, we still can enjoy our, uh, our strengths, recognize our strengths, and it's peaceful. We're not, uh, we're not frustrated. So I would say those are the main ones. So I'm looking to see if any other questions have come in. Oh, constructive criticism. There's a good one. Okay. So constructive criticism is uh, towards ourselves or other people. I'll just kind of, I guess, all in the same, same vein. If it's constructive, it's given in love. It's positive. It's still valuing the other person. So some of it has to do with the motive and the delivery. When I was teaching school, one of the things they taught us was to use like the Oreo approach where you sandwich the uh, suggestion between two compliments, such as you are such a talented um, musician. 
I would appreciate it if you kind of watched um, how loud you sing. I know somebody this happened to. But you have such a beautiful voice, but most of us, we, we can't really match your volume. So I do know someone that happened to. That's why I'm using that example. It's not aimed at anybody here since uh, I know a lot of the people who follow me have musical gifts. So some of it has to do with the motive. Some of it has to do with the delivery. Plus, if the only time you talk to people is to give them constructive criticism um, and you don't give them lots of compliments separated from criticism or input or feedback, then uh, it's going to be harder for people to receive it. But some people just don't like input no matter how nice you are about it. But I would say those are the guidelines for how to know if it's constructive. Okay. Any other questions before I pray for us? So Lord, I thank you that we all have things that we can work on, but that you are patient with us. So I pray that the things that we've talked about today will help each person now and in the replay to receive more from you about our value as a person, as a unique person, our worth, our purpose, that you would help us to unyoke from negative relationships or trauma or rejection from the past, and that we would be able to embrace who you've created us to be and the new opportunities and the new relationships that are available to us now. I thank you, Lord, for, for each individual here, and I pray you would bless them in their endeavors and help them to be patient with themselves as they grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, thanks so much for watching, for listening. Um, I really enjoy being able to share these principles with people. I think I put a link that if you want to pick up one of the books, you can follow that. And uh, all right. So hopefully that will help everybody. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.